Nancy was going to do an introduction. So you ready for me, Nick? Okay. All right, everyone, welcome to our second fall Western Maine Audubon talk. Great to have so many of you signed on. Um, a little background as to, to uh, why we asked Herb to talk this evening. Uh, back in what I call the BC era before COVID, we thought it would be nice to um, do something that went along with the state's 200 celebration, 200 birthday celebration from an Audubon point of view. So we kind of thought this through and wondered what sorts of birds would a farmer taking an evening stroll see in the state back then? And what would be, what would the area around him really look like? So we've asked two distinguished teachers in the area to tackle these queries of ours. And tonight we're very pleased to have Herb Wilson with us to discuss the changes that have been taking place in bird populations over the last 200 years. He is Professor Emeritus of Biology at Colby College. Some of you may have seen the columns that he puts out in news media, et cetera. And he's certainly a well-known ornithologist in the area here. On November 11th, we are going to have Drew Barton from University of Maine at Farmington talking about changes in plants, uh, the forest, and the general lay of the land, I guess you could say, in our area as well. So I don't want to take up any more time from Herb, and I am turning it over to him. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Oh, Again, thank you for, for tuning in. I see a lot of old friends who've tuned in from places I, I didn't expect, so it's, it's nice to see a, a lot of those names. Um, I've given a lot of talks at Western Maine Audubon over the last 30 years, but this is, of course, the first virtual one I've done, so I'm looking forward to it. And ironically, I think this is the biggest, biggest audience I've ever had, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm going to switch to my power. She's going to try to find it. There it is. OK, so m much has happened over the last 200 years uh, in the, the case of birds. And of course, the farther back we go, the, the more nebulous it becomes, because we obviously didn't have a whole lot of hard data on bird abundance uh, 150, 200 years ago. But we do have ways of being detectives and, and trying to understand what is going on with our bird fauna. So tonight, what I'm going to do is to uh, not talk about all 459 species of birds that have been found in Maine, but rather I'm going to break them down into several categories. So first, we're going to talk about birds that uh, we used to have, but we don't anymore. So these are birds that were resident in Maine uh, and are now extinct. Start with those, a bit of a downer. I'm going to talk about very unusual birds. Uh, the, the great naturalist Roger Tory Peterson had a, 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 gave a quotation that I liked. He said, birds have wings and they use them. So we have lots and lots of birds that have been found in Maine that are out of place. That How in the world did you get here? So what we're going to do is to quickly go through and enjoy some of those, those birds that have only been seen once or twice in the state. But then the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about birds that are holding steady. And then we're going to talk about birds that have increased in Maine and some, in fact, have uh, invaded Maine even in the last 30 or 40 years. And then to end, we're going to talk about birds that are not doing so well. Um, and what I this is a topic that I could talk on for hours, so I'm going to try to speak for about 40 minutes or so, so we leave time for questions. But let's first start with the birds that uh, have been uh, extirpated, uh, largely through the hands of humans uh, in the last 200 years. And we have with the great auk, um, which was a, a flightless bird, it was found in Maine. Uh, and let me take a look at this map here, and you can see in the, breed, the breeding areas were uh, here up in Can off of Newfoundland, off of uh, Prince Edward Island, and 
up, up in Greenland and in Iceland. Uh, there, this was a bird that was spread on the sides of the North Atlantic, but we know that they wintered uh, all down through New England, so we certainly had them here. And of course, being flightless, they uh, were susceptible to easily being captured, and they were captured by, uh, by fishermen uh, for food, for fat, to use as bait for lobsters and fish, and they were also collected for feathers. And their eggs were easy pickings uh, during the breeding season, so that was a, a problem as well. So their population declined uh, pretty quickly once humans started harassing them. Uh, the last one was sighted in Canada in, on Grenadine Island, just a, just a stone's throw from Lubeck, Maine, in 1870. In 1872, the last one was uh, seen in London. So uh, a species that would love to see, but uh, of course we can't. And of course, this is the, uh, the mascot of the American Ornithologist Union, what's now the American Ornithological Societies. The genus name of the great auk is Pinguinus, P-I-N-G-U-I-N-E-U-S, which means fat, and that's certainly appropriate. But uh, lots of uh, sailors that spent time in the Antarctic, and there they saw the equivalent of, of the great auk, flightless birds. And knowing the name Pinguinus for the great auk, they started calling their, the birds down there penguins. So the, our great auk is the inspiration for penguins. It's not penguins are the inspiration for the great auk's penguin-like shape. Anyway, no longer with us. Another nice drawing of, of great auk. And then there's the Labrador duck, uh, which is a bird that we don't know a whole heck of a lot about. Um, we don't even know where they nested, but we do know that they wintered off the coast of New England and the mid-Atlantic states. So you can see where they spent time on the coastal uh, areas uh, of the North and Mid Atlantic. Um, so not, not, no, no, knowing very little about them is certainly, certainly very frustrating. But the last one uh, was seen in 1873, and we don't really understand very well why they, they went extinct. Uh, they don't seem to have been common enough for humans to have been bothered with them very much, but uh, it's a species that never scientific interest. So um, very beautiful looking diving duck. And then uh, perhaps the saddest of all, a passenger pigeon. Uh, population of passenger pigeon uh, 250 years ago was estimated at 5 billion birds, which means that they made up a quarter of the birds in, in North, and North America. So, uh, and of course, they are all gone now. You can see, perhaps, it's sort of hard to see the lines, but this line here represents their breeding range or their range. And this dotted line here, which includes uh, part of Maine, is where they did most of their breeding. So that this is the heaviest concentration of these birds. But nomadic birds uh, wandering huge flocks. Uh, John James Audubon, saw a flock in Kentucky that darkened the sky for four days, and he estimated the population of, of, the, of that flock at 1 and 1.2 billion birds. And his uh, contemporary, um, Alexander Wilson, saw a similar flock, and he came up with about 2 billion birds. Can you imagine that in one flock? But these were colonial nesters, and the colony seemed to be were in the th hundreds of thousands of birds hundreds of thousands of birds. Um, and it is thought by some that if the population wasn't big enough, hugely big enough, then the reproductive organs of the birds wouldn't, wouldn't develop and they would not be able to reproduce. These are, of course, harvested in huge numbers by, uh, by gunners uh, for food and shipped mostly to the, to the New York area. But uh, just because they're so colonial, they were easily captured and uh, there's no question that human hands caused the demise of these birds. They were seen in the fives and tens in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, in the 1900, the American Ornithology Union put out uh, a reward between 1910 and 1912 for anyone that could find a living passenger pigeon, and they never spent their money. The last one died, uh, Martha, in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. 
And finally, oh, there's a couple more passenger pigeons. And here's just one of these flocks. You can imagine how easy it would be to take huge numbers of these birds. And then the, the final one is actually not a species, but a subspecies of, of the greater prairie chicken. It's called, it was called the heath hen. So if we take a look at this, there are three subspecies of, uh, of the greater prairie chicken. There's the, the main subspecies found here. There's Atwater's prairie chicken down, down, down here in um, Oklahoma, South Oklahoma. And then there was, uh, for a, a while, uh, the heath hen, which was found in the east. And it barely sneaked up into Maine. This was a bird of scrub oak. So in areas of the forest around the Kennebec Plains, as an example, would have been a good place to, to look for heath hens. Um, and th they did go extinct. Uh, the, the last one um, on, in, in mainland, uh, east, eastern North America, was seen in 1870, but some persisted on to, in Martha's Vineyard in the, until 1932. But as well. And here's a photograph of the 1932 birds, they, they were around since photography was invented, so we can actually have pictures of these birds, unlike the other ones that are now extinct. And there's a stuffed specimen, one of, one of these birds. So now let's talk about some fun birds, birds that you say, what? How in the world did this bird get here? What is it doing here? And one example is this European bird, the ring plover, that was seen in Lubeck on the South Lubeck sandbar flats. Uh, looks a whole lot like a semi-palmated plover, doesn't it? But it has a distinctive call. And so it was uh, picked out by Louis Bevere and others as a, as a common ring plover. Fantastic sighting. Kirtland's warbler. Uh, unusual bird. They, they uh, breed in jack pine forest in upper, upper lower peninsula, Michigan, and also a few other places. But the population was down to 200 at one point, mostly because of cowbird brood parasitism, but they, they overwinter in uh, Bermuda, Bermuda or Bahamas. Uh, anyway, uh, persons found one of these at Kennebec Plains one, May, one late, late May, just a few years ago. So that was really a bird that was quite lost, but uh, it's the only record we have in the state. And the population still is only about 2,000. So uh, the odds of seeing one of these birds is pretty remote outside of their normal flyway. Fieldfare is a European relative of the robin. We have one record of violet green swallow. It looks a whole lot like a tree swallow, doesn't it? But you'll notice the white goes up on the side of the rump. Uh, and we have one record for violet green swallow uh, fairly recently in the state. This is a, a bird that caught my fancy because I was, I was in school in Baltimore at the time when I heard about it. We were tempted to try to come up and see this bird. It was found in Biddeford Pool. And initially it was identified as a streaked flycatcher, or at that time what was called a sulfur-bellied flycatcher, which is a non-migratory bird found in Arizona. Uh, but subsequent uh, analysis indicated that this was actually a variegated flycatcher, which is even more amazing. It's found in South America. And the ones at the extreme south of the range down in Argentina actually do migrate north toward the austral winter, and that would have been uh, perhaps explaining one of these things got a little exuberant and ended up at Bitterford Pool. So fantastic bird. And obviously, uh, not too many records of these guys. Hey, Herb, I'm wondering if you could pause really quick. The, the audio issue is still happening a little bit. So I'm going to try turning off your video for a little bit to see if that maybe frees things up. Is that okay? So we can still see the screen. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. All right. We shall give yep. it a try. Go ahead. So Crested Caracara found just a few springs ago uh, in the Waterville area. This is a terrestrial falcon, uh, mostly found, well, it's, it's found very broadly through the tropics, but uh, Texas is a place to see them, but uh, Fabiwani, Maine is pretty amazing. The spoonbills, of course, are coastal birds, and think, well, where was this seen? Maybe Scarborough Marsh? No, it was seen at Dover Flexcroft. So it's in a pond uh, in Dover Foxcroft. Was it last summer or the summer before last? Uh, pretty amazing. And then red-footed falcon. This is an African bird. And one showed up uh, here in Maine some years ago. It's fantastic. 
uh, obviously very much uh, uh, challenged as far as directions were concerned. And then red-billed tropic bird, one has been seen off the, is been looking for a mate for the last 10 or 15 years off the coast of Maine, Matenicus Rock, Seal Rock. Um, and I guess it was there this summer, it was obviously a lot less traffic going out to look for it with, in these COVID days. Um, slave bill ball uh, found at the Augusta dump, Hatch Hill dump, uh, the bird right here found by Louis Bevere. Uh, and it's the only record, I think, of slady bill gull in the, in the state. A western bird, wandering tattler, just one record, fantastically beautiful bird. And European golden plover, you can figure out where that's, that's from as well. And then perhaps the most famous uh, rarity that we've had is uh, the great greater black hawk, which was seen two August ago in um, Prout's Neck, and then spent much of the early part of the winter in, in late fall and early winter in, uh, in, in, in downtown Portland. So a lot, a lot of people from all over the country got to see this rare from the tropics. And corncrake is a, a, a rail that was found on Monhegan by, uh, by Doug, and uh, rails are amazing. They have these little short wings, but yet they are able to fly long distances. This is a European bird, and uh, rails are well known for getting to islands. So there are lots of island species of rails. But this corncrake was, was fantastic. And then a couple of hummingbirds you never know. This is a Western hummingbird, the calliope, very small. And then even jazzier is this Mexican violet ear showed up once. And it's, of course, uh, well to our south normally, out of the country. And then recently, Clark's grebe showed up in Ontogas Pond in Augusta. Uh, and lots and lots of birders got to see that a few weeks in late August, uh, much to the dismay of many of the Togus uh, residents who got tired of people uh, riding along the road looking for the Clark's Cree, but some of them were delighted to, to entertain birders. So uh, I think most people that tried to see it got, got a chance to see the Clark's Cree. But there was one prior record uh, off the coast, of the mid, mid, mid uh, coast somewhere. So let's talk about birds that one would, would not imagine should be here. So these are birds that were introduced by humans. And one of them is, of course, our rock pigeon. And if we take a look at the distribution of rock pigeons in the wild, this is where they are found. So these are birds that are feral. They are wild birds. And my wife and I had a chance to visit the north part of Scotland here where there are feral rock doves. And it was amazing because you couldn't get within 200 meters of them. But they are easily domesticated and now they, they were, they've been introduced, they were introduced into North America uh, in the 17th century. So soon after colonization, they brought pigeons and of course they're used for food. And this is the distribution of pigeons in North America now. So uh, a pretty, pretty good uh, introduction. So even, even now, all, 200 years ago, we would have we would have pigeons in Maine, but starlings a different story. Starlings were introduced into North America in Central Park in over a period of 1886, 1888, something like that. A, a man named Eugene who was an expatriate Brit decided he was living right in, in Manhattan, Upper Manhattan, and he decided that he wanted to introduce all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare into Central Park. And this was his first project. So he introduced uh, uh, about 100 starlings into uh, Central Park, and they took off. And my goodness, this is where starlings are found normally. So a little bit of Africa, but mostly Eurasia. But look what starlings have done now. From those, that introduction in, in uh, New York City, they spread all throughout North America. And not without uh, significant effects. So if we take a look at the starling, its bill is remarkable. It's very strong, it's pointed, yet, yet it's able to crush. So the seeds are able to catch insects and other and small vertebrates even. They're able to take fruits and they are a real hassle for lots of uh, fruit growers. So, and they also are cavity nesters. So they're competing with woodpeckers and chickadees and nuthatches and bluebirds for nesting sites. And the final one we'll talk about that was introduced uh, from away 
was a house sparrow. And here you can see one who's decided to make home, its home in a tree swallow box. But house sparrows are an unusual species because they're the only species, only species that I'm aware of that evolved entirely with humans. So they're never found away from human habitation. They arose in uh, this, in the, in the uh, Middle East, in this part of the, in, in Iraq, Iran, or thought to have arisen originally, but now they've spread naturally all throughout Europe and Asia and in parts of, of Africa. But because they've been introduced so widely and they can always find human habitation, they've done really well all around the world. So if we take a look in North America, oh, well, I should tell you, a uh, hundred birds were purchased for 200 bucks by a man named Nicholas Pike uh, in 1871, something like that. Uh, he inter introduced them into Brooklyn and there were two more introductions. One was in San Francisco, in late 1870s and another in Salt Lake City about the same time. And those three introductions resulted in this. Oh, they have spread pretty widely. So house sparrows, again, always associated with humans. So agricultural, uh, agricultural habitats and city habitats are places to see them. And you're not going to find them in the middle of, of Baxter State Park. But they are cavity nesters as well. And so they do compete for, with other cavity nesting birds like bluebirds. Um, and in fact, what you can do is you, you can make your opening to a tree, a tree swallow or a bluebird box a little bit smaller than this one, so about the, the house sparrows. So let's talk about some of the information that we have on bird abundance uh, in the state over the last 200 years. John James Audubon came to visit us. He, he came here in 1832 with his son and several other people. They spent a month in Denny'sville, just west of, Co of Cobscook Bay in Washington County. I guess Washington County then, but that's where they were in Denny'sville at the Lincoln, at the Lincoln establishment. Um, and then they were heading on up to Labrador on a, on a trip uh, later in 1832. So we have some information from Audubon. This was a, a book published in 1901 by Ora Knight. So it was the first uh, ornithology of the birds of Maine. And then that was followed up in 1951 by Ralph Palmer, so fish, a, a wildlife biologist. And we also have the uh, Christmas bird count. So that's a great way to get information on the abundance of birds uh, throughout, the country, throughout the country. And in fact, now the world starting in 1900. So we have a, quite a lot of data on bird abundance from the Christmas bird count. We also have the North American Breeding Bird Survey. So for breeding birds, this was started in 1966 and continues until today. So we'll be talking a lot about that information today. One of the first atlases, state atlases of breeding birds was in fact done in Maine. It was done, as you can see, over a six year period. Uh, and it was a bare bones, <clears throat> a bare bones uh, undertaking. Uh, and you will see a couple of uh, maps from, from them before we're done today. We have a current uh, atlas project going on. Uh, so we've just finished the third year, two more years to go. And uh, this is a much more substantive uh, atlas, lots and lots of volunteers and lots of great technology to help with the mapping and the analysis. And then uh, Peter Vickery, who passed away a few years ago, was working on the Birds of Maine, uh, sort of, the, it was a, an update. Well, it was a new Birds of Maine. The last one would be published in 1951 by Ralph Palmer, right? Uh, anyway, P Peter passed away before completion, but uh, his wife Barbara and Scott Widensall have edited the book and uh, three other authors uh, ha have helped as well. Uh, and it's going to be released on November 3rd. It's published by Princeton University Press. And uh, I just got, got I, I ordered a pre-publication uh, copy or I ordered a copy in advance. And I just got an email today that mine was shipped today. So I'll be getting it soon. But anyway, uh, everyone in Bur Maine that interested in birds a copy of Peter's, of Peter's fantastic book. Okay, so let's talk about using breeding bird survey. Let's talk about some birds in Maine that are doing okay. And uh, when you see these curves, the, the dark curve here uh, represents the average of, of this particular analysis. 
and this is the lower and the upper confidence limit. So in these times of political polling, we, you hear about uh, this person has a 67% of the votes, plus or minus 3%. So this is the plus or minus 3%. So this is the, all, in all likelihood, the actual numbers fall somewhere between here and here. 95% chance the numbers are between here and here, with the highest chance being here. So you get the idea. If a if the curves are going up, it's good. If they're going down, it's bad. So ruby thirty hummingbirds actually started maybe a little bit of an increase. That's good. We like that. Uh, Red-eyed vireos, there's some going up and down a little bit, but uh, holding our own. And that's always good to see. And you can see these num are numbers per uh, breeding bird survey route. So there are 50 stops along a 24 and a half mile uh, area stretch of road. So people are seeing about one per stop. And that's pretty good. Blue jays, showing some up and down, but pretty, pretty stable overall. And of course our state bird, chickadee, doing fine. And oven birds, uh, if there's anything going on with oven birds, they may be showing a little bit of an increase. So that's good. And that's true for the northern. I pictures of all these. So otherwise we would have so many slides, it would be uh, just too many. So, but you will know most of these birds anyway. The black throated greens showing a pretty much equilibrium level as well. Herring gulls. We know from Aura Knight's uh, book in, published in 1901 that herring gulls were actually pretty uncommon in Maine. They were only in spring and fall along most of the coast and their numbers were not were never really very high and I think a lot of their abundance has to do with humans with uh, the fact that they can easily find food at, at uh, transfer stations and open dumps and uh, parking lots and whatever so herring gulls are a lot more common now than they were 100, 120 years ago. Wing warblers, birds that were not found in Maine 50 years ago even, have now pushed into Maine and are becoming breeders. So we can see that uh, they pushed up, up, up north of Portland now, up in the, the, the Brunswick area, uh, and confirmed breeding down in, in southern Maine. So it's a bird that's pushed up. Perhaps it's because of global warming. Perhaps their populations are increasing, being forced to, to some individuals are being forced to move elsewhere. But anyway, it's a, it's a story of birds that are increasing in Maine. We like that. Here's the house finch. The house finch was uh, a relatively recent arrival in Maine. About 1979, the first house finches were found in Maine. And let's take a look at the, at the map of these birds. You can see that there's a, a western population and there's an eastern population. Well, guess how the eastern population got here? House finches were often captured by uh, pet store owners and carried east and sold as Hollywood finches. And they're fairly colorful, as you know, and they sang readily in captivity. And there was a big, a, a good trade of them going on in New York City particularly. And one of the, the owners, a pet owner, shop owners, got wind that the Fish and Wildlife Service was about to bust them. And so he let all of his house finches go from New York City in 1939. And since then, all of this population here has resulted from that in single introduction. So you can see we've almost gotten back to the original, original uh, here. But uh, built pretty rapidly in Maine, and you can see what they've done. They re increased rapidly once they start they got introduced. Uh, and then there was a huge crash, and this crash was caused by a disease called mycoplasmosis. It was a conjunct eye conjunctivitis. And it caused a crash of the population, and they frankly have never recovered. So their numbers are relatively modest compared to what they were in the in the mid mid to early 19, uh, 18, 1990s. And they had a, a, a they've had an effect on purple finches because purple finches sort of had the, the 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 finch niche to themselves before house finches got here. And house finches, which mostly like human altered habitats, have forced purple finches away out to more forested areas. So there's a female purple finch. And you can see their populations have fallen, which is in, in part, but not entirely, due to the introduction of house finches. Bluebirds, in part because of aggressive uh, building of bluebird trails, bluebirds have 
done reasonably well in Maine. That their numbers were pretty low. That we're worried about the house sparrows competing with them, but again, we know making the holes small enough will keep the house sparrows away. So bluebirds, that's a good, good sign. Titmice, relatively rare in Maine, uh, not at all in Maine in 1950, relatively rare through the 1990s, but they have pushed north as well. Again, perhaps because of global climate change, uh, but you can see what the population has done. Uh, and if we take a look at the breeding bird atlas from 1978 to 83, I told you it was pretty bare bones. Uh, this is done on mimeograph paper, I think. But you can see there are relatively few records uh, throughout the state uh, of tufted titmice. Let's take a look from the recent breeding bird atlas, and you can see that they have pushed up north of Skowhegan, uh, well, well north, uh, and there have been population. There's been at least some sightings in the in extreme down east Maine as well. So uh, there's an increasing bird in Maine. Hairy woodpeckers. A resident bird, but for reasons I don't really understand, they're increasing, but that's great. And then Carolina Wren is another one of these southern southerly birds that's pushing northward. So what we have is uh, an expansion north, and you can see that's pretty obvious there, particularly if we look at the, the upper upper bound. But uh, even here, you can see that there's a, been an increase in breeding of Carolina Wrens in the state. Turkey vultures, uh, virtually unheard of 40 years ago in the state, and they're just, a, in 1979, 8 to 83, just a few records, uh, only a few confirmed breeding records, those are the dark boxes there. But take a look at them now. My goodness, they're all the way up in the rest, northern Aristic County. So another species that has expanded uh, aggressively into Maine. Cardinals. Uh, here in Central Maine, uh, never heard cardinals singing when we first moved here in 1990. I missed them having grown up in North Carolina, but now their their songs are, are a constant part of the summer summer chorus. So they've increased pushing northward as well. Prairie warblers, not very common in Maine 50 years ago, and now they've increased pretty successfully. Uh, I guess I don't have the map of them. And then red-bellied woodpeckers is another great example of a, of a southerly species pushing north. Again, perhaps in part because of amelioration of the climate, perhaps because of the increased population size of the south. But at any rate, they have pushed um, into the um, central part of the state anyway, and I think will continue to, to push northward through time. So lots of increases in birds in Maine, good, good news. Then there are success stories that we can we really want to celebrate. And one of them of course came because of the, in large part because of the work of this mainer, Rachel Carson, who wrote in 1962 Silent Spring, and she alerted the world to the fact that our bird populations were decreasing drastically, particularly birds that were feeding on fish or or higher predators. And it was because of DDT. And DDT, a, a great insecticide used right after World War II, uh, particularly uh, biomagnifies in the food chain and it interferes with calcium metabolism of birds. So the female birds were laying eggs that were so weak that they got crushed when they would, when the female would try to incubate them. So in uh, by 1960 or so, the pelican state, Louisiana, had no pelicans at all. And osprey, bald eagles, and peregrine falcons uh, crashed. And since then, we cleaned up the, the, uh, the DDT or stopped using the DDT and uh, have instituted uh, conservation programs and bald eagles have fantastically rebounded. So what, what a great success story that is. Sad that they crashed, but at least they recovered. And the same thing is true of ospreys. So we don't have enough pair of falcons in Maine to make sense of a pattern because they're relatively rare. Now, we want to talk about uh, some birds that are cause for concern. And I'm, I'm breaking this up into several categories, but the first are the aerial insectivores. Um, people come up to me a lot and they say, you know, I used to have barn swallows, or I used to have 
cat birds or whatever in my yard. Uh, what's going on? And my answer often was, well, birds come and go in a particular place. Conservation biologists like to talk about winking. winking. So you can imagine that, that you have a, a habitat, we, we'll just draw a circle around it. If the eye is open and the birds are there, but if it closes, then they're gone. But it may open again, so birds come and go. Um, but when birds disappear over large areas, then you start to worry about things. And so sometimes when I was saying, well, I think it's just a local effect, it in fact was not not such a local effect. And one of those cases was certainly with barn swallows, which we can, can see here. And let's take a look. Well, let's, we'll start with purple martins. And we'll come and talk about barn swallows in just a moment. But purple martins are admittedly near the northern part of their range here in, in Maine. But uh, again, nesting in cavities and no purple martin nest in anything other than human provided habitat nowadays is pretty amazing. But uh, they are, are often very abundant. Um, and there you can see they're obviously colonial, so you can have lots in a single place. Look what's happened in Maine. Just a, a, a rather radical crash. And we can take a look at the data from the old breeding bird atlas, and you can see that there, there's sort of this line that goes uh, from southwest to northeast. And I, I remember my wife and I, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, found ourselves up in this part of, of northern Washington County in Princeton, and there was a huge colony of purple martins there. Well, they're not there anymore. This is the current breeding distribution of purple martins in the state. And you can see that we've lost all of the ones up here and the ones that are still left are relatively meager, relatively few. So that's the problem. And what do the purple martins eat? Flying insects. And we believe that flying insect abundance is greatly diminishing. We know that insect abundance overall is diminishing, but the aerial insects, the ones that the martins and the swallows and the swifts and the night jars eat, seem to be diminishing particularly quickly. So here's another chimney swift crash. Eastern kingbird. This is pretty depressing. Sorry, but we need to we need to see the data. Eastern wood peewee. Least flycatcher. I'm not cherry picking. We're looking at the most abundant ones. Eastern phoebe, and you say, oh, well, maybe here's something that's uh, a, a good news. Well, I don't think so. And the reason is that, is, is you, as you know, Eastern Phoebes are our earliest flycatcher to come back. They sometimes come back in early May, uh, early March rather, uh, and they're about the last to leave. So you can still see Phoebes right now. And the reason they can do that, even when there are not insects flying around, is that they are a little more varied in their diet, that they eat fruits. So if they don't have flying insects, then they can eat fruits. And so they're able to do a little better than their related species that are strict aerial insectivores. Tree swallows, boom. Bank swallows. And here's the barn swallow. In the 1978 to 83 breeding bird atlas, barn swallows were I think the third most common bird recorded on the, on the atlases for, for breeding. Now they're not even in the top 10. It's there's something like the 28th most common species recorded breeding in the state. So, um, and the same thing is true of tree swallows. They were in the top 10 in the early atlas and they are well down in the middle of the pack in the current atlas. So a different way of looking at, uh, a different source of information that shows the same pattern. Whippoorwills, so we're looking at the, the night jars, decline pretty drastically. Nighthawks, kestrels, I know kestrels aren't not, except aerial insectivores, but there, there's other species that's showing a relatively drastic decline. And flickers are showing a decline. Flickers are largely ant eaters, um, feeding on the ground, and perhaps ant abundance is going down. I just don't know what the reason for this decline is. And uh, Bert was uh, before we started. Bert was asking about uh, about, about evening grosbeaks, and Eat. And I know a lot of folks have been seeing evening grosbeaks speaks lately. They, they are certainly an enigmatic species. And we should hasten to add that they're not native to Eastern North America. 
that they are a Western species that was, was introduced into the East because of uh, the introduction particularly of their favored food, which is box elder. So box elders were uh, introduced into the East and that provided food for some of the food for evening gross beaks. But you can see that they had a really, really good time in the late 1960s. And you know what was going on here? It was a gypsy worm uh, epidemic. And so the evening gross beaks switched to gypsy worms and uh, and their populations, the evening gross beak population skyrocketed. And then of course they crashed because the gypsy worm abundance went way down and they really never recovered. But I, I think we are sort of misled by the fact that they for a brief time, at least 30, 40 years ago, they were really abundant. But now they are relatively uncommon and uh, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of them except to, to so know that they wander a lot and that I'm always glad when I see or hear some of them. Then we've got the neotropical migrants, birds that nest in North America and winter in the tropics. And Doug Turborg, um, a biologist, I think he was at Princeton at the time, but now he's at Duke. He wrote a book, uh, where, where Have All the Birds Gone? And he was just noticing that uh, compared to his memory of, of the abundance of warblers when he was growing up, that warblers are just not as common now. This was 1989. And we know that that is a real problem. And using the breeding bird survey data, we know that a lot of these neotropic migrants are declining. So yellow throats, wood thrushes, furies, white throated sparrows, red starts, chestnut sided warblers, yellow warblers. And of course, the reason for these declines is complex because we really have three things to worry about, don't we? What's going on the breeding grounds where we are? We have to worry what's going on in the in the wintering grounds where lots of deforestation may be occurring, and we have to worry about what's going on along the migratory routes. So there are all sorts of perils for these birds, but the overall effect is that they are declining. Scarlet tanager is declining, and the the last group of birds that we'll mention are the the grassland birds. This, this is actually a picture of Kennebec Plains. And uh, what we can see at Kennebec Plains is bobolinks, but not as many as we used to. It's showing a pretty drastic decline. Savannah sparrows as well. And of course, we have grasshopper sparrows at a few places in Maine, but their numbers aren't big enough that we can really get statistically valid information on their abundance. And, uh, and so off they go. So we'll go to this nice fellow here while I, I just make a few closing comments. So what we've seen is that, uh, as you would expect, when you've got 450 species, some birds are gonna be increasing, some are decreasing, some are holding the same. And what's good for one bird may be bad for another. Clear cutting is really bad for winter wrens and swings and thrushes and Tennessee wolves, but it's good for morning warblers and Lincoln sparrows. But there are human effects that we're having that are obviously causing really horrible things to happen to our birds. And so uh, what I've done is to, to talk about some of the happy news and end it with some of the bad news because that's what we need to keep thinking about is that the birds have wonderful voices they can't speak for themselves. And so we do that for them. So thank you so much and I'll, I'll be glad to take some questions. Thank you, Herb. I'm going to turn All your right. video back on. And if Nancy, you want to turn your video back on as well, we could take some questions. And the way, um, the way the questions work well here is that if you see down below everybody on the lower panel, there is a box that says Q and A. Um, if you could type your questions into there instead of the chat, that's a much better, easier for us to not lose track of the questions. Um, and uh, Bert, Nancy, do you want me to yes. uh, facilitate the questions or? Um, okay, oh, you're on. You're on mute. Uh, the naps, just so you know. Um, so, uh, Herb, a question from Joan. She and uh, we've heard. Uh, this is a, a question we get a lot sometimes. I have a male cardinal bashing himself into my window all summer, and he's still doing it. Why? 
It's hormones. Um, so, so what, what the uh, what the what the bird is doing is defending his territory against himself. So he, he sees his reflection and he thinks it's another intruding bird. But the card cardinals will maintain a, a territory that they don't want an, another male impinging on their territory. So I think that's what's going on. Yep, hormones. Yeah. Um, a question from Stan here. What is predating tree swallow young in nest boxes? Uh, I don't know, actually. That's yeah. So I'm sure that I'm sure that snakes maybe maybe one source. I don't know what else. Huh? Have, have have you have you had evidence of predation, Stan, in your tree swallow on among your sweet tree swallow nestlings? Not sure. Um, and, and do you want to talk a little bit about what happens? What, what one of the Go ahead. Yeah, what, what, one of the big advantages of, of, of being a, a cavity nester is that relatively few predators can get in there. And one of the neat patterns that we see is that birds that nest in cavities have much higher sizes than birds that don't. For instance, most warblers have lay four eggs, but the prothonotary warbler, which lay, lays eggs in, in a nest cavity, will lay six eggs. So it's a sure bet that they're going to make it. So they, they invest a little bit more. So um, I think the chances of predation are greatly diminished if you're in, in a nest cavity or a nest box. Stan says, yes, he has two nest boxes with young that were pecked to death, he said. Gruesome. Could it be house, house sparrows? That, yeah. it's house spar that's, it's house sparrows. Yeah, so you need to those opening smaller in your box. I, I had that happen with, with bluebirds in our yard as well, and so I had to go to war against the house sparrows. And if I may, I, I would recommend a site from Cornell called Nest Watch. Um, you can go in there and they will give you plans for various species, um, you know, particular hole size, information like which direction it, the box should be facing, how high off the ground, things like that, that can be really make the difference between uh, you know, getting the birds you want into the nest boxes. So it's a, just go to Nest Watch from Cornell. Um, question here from Diane. Um, this is, what a nice question this is. She's new to Maine. Is it good, she says, <laughs> that, that she has white-throated sparrows? Yes, it's wonderful that you have white-throated sparrows. Yeah, and this is, this is a good time to see them in migration. So but I, I, I think they're, they're wonderful. Poor Sam Peabody song is just, just one of the great sounds of Maine, of the Maine woods. Great, we, we have a, um, another question from Diane. Um, it's another Diane from Waterville. She said, since August, she has had cardinals twice have their young on my property. I have observed several now with non-red beaks and assume these were the fledglings, uh, but also don't seem to see adults with red beaks. So maybe you want to talk about different plumage differences in cardinals. Yeah. So so the the, the red beaks of, of a of a is is actually due to plant material to carotenoids. And so they get that food from the, the carotenoids that are in the seeds that they eat. So if a male has a particularly bright orange bill, it's because he's a good forager. He can find food that's rich in the carotenoids. So you can have adults that have very dull bills, but it's an advertisement that they're not a very good forager. And so they will tend to be males. So it's what, in, in biology, we call that an honest signal. You can't fake it. If you're a bad forager, you're not gonna have a bright bill. So, hmm. it, but the young, the young birds are, are typically always gonna have that dull bill because they're not very good at foraging and haven't had time to really build up their carotenoid levels. That's fascinating. Uh, and despite what the St. Louis Cardinals will tell you, you'll never see one with a yellow bill. Um, so uh, Thomas, Ham exactly. Thomas Hamilton asks, uh, is there data to support the suggestion that flying insect populations have decreased? Oh, yeah, yeah there's, there's a, an abundance of, the, of data, actually. There's a, um, 
I'm not going to be able to remember exactly when, but um, about four or five weeks, four or five months ago, there was a, a very nice article in the New York Times Magazine, Sunday Magazine, on insect abundance. And so um, I suspect you can Google that pretty easily, but I, I would check that out as a, as a good introduction. There are also a, a number of, of uh, scientific papers that have been published lately. Um, and if you, if, you want, if you want to email me, um, I, I will be glad to give you some citations. Uh, maybe put that in the chat. Your voice broke up as you were saying that. So maybe you type that out in the chat. That would be that would be helpful for everyone. Um, while you're doing that, a question from uh, Margie or Margie. Are rose-breasted gross beaks increasing or decreasing? Uh, don't, offhand, I don't know. I, I don't, I'd, I'd be surprised if they're doing anything but keeping steady. I, I haven't heard of anyone worried, worried about them, but on the other hand, I haven't found them particularly abundant just in my wandering around. And, and another question have, have from Joan, have robins gotten bigger in size over the years? Hmm, not to my knowledge. Um, it, it, we do have we do have several different groups of, of robins that come to Maine. There's there's some birds that that breed in Newfoundland that are a little darker, and have different size than the one the, the ones that we normally see. So there there could be these uh, subspecific differences. I'm not aware of them, but it, it may be a reason enough to have there may be enough of a reason enough of a difference to to cause you to think, well, these birds are particularly big. And of course, the robins can puff up like most birds. So if it's a cool day, they, they'll appear larger than they would on a, on a really warm day. So if folks have additional questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, there's one in the chat. We'll take those two from Fenwick. Is there a recent trend for robins wintering over in Maine? That, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, the, a, a good source of would be look at the at the Christmas bird count data, and uh, I, I haven't done that. Um, it, looking at the Christmas bird count data is a, it's a it's a little more laborious than looking at the breeding bird survey data because they, they got, have done a lot of the analyses for you already. But my, my own impression is that. Um, they're high, highly variable as to whether they overwinter or not. And in, in large part, it's how the, the fruit crop is. Because the thing about birds is that they are awfully tough. They can tolerate very, very cold temperatures as long as they can find food. For instance, common red poles, they can overwinter at 70 degrees north um, as long as there's enough birch seed available for them to feed on. If there's not a whole lot of birch seed, then they leave and we get to see them in, in those winters. The same thing I true, think is probably true with winter berries and mountain ash and so forth. They're perfectly happy to stick around the crab apple um, fruits and so forth. But when those fruit abundances are low, then they're forced to leave. And that and fruit abundance is notoriously variable from season to season. So it's uh, there's no there's no clear pattern I would say of of an increase or decrease. Great. And, and I did want to mention a comment from Cynthia in the chat here to encourage birds in your yard, see books from Doug Ptolemy on the right plantings. Um, a, a quick shout out because I, because they pay my bills to Maine Audubon's Bringing Nature Home program, which we took the name from Doug Ptolemy's books about planting native plants. Um, check out uh, our website about which plants might work in your yard. And uh, we also sell plants throughout the year, although uh, we've just ceased for the year. So good comment from Cynthia. Um, Question from Lou King King. Speaking of robins, I really believe that robins are different in Maine than upstate New York, where uh, I often live. It seems to me that the ones here are less saturated in color and more, more lurky in behavior. Um, do you think that's true or could be true? It could be true. I, I, I have no, no idea. Uh, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not aware. I work on that, but it's really possible. Yeah. So we got a couple more questions here um, from Bob. What drives snowy owls in Maine? Um, yes, yeah, so, 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 
bells belong to this group of birds that, that we call the eruptive birds. So they're birds that, that nest at high latitude. And if there's sufficient food available for them, then they will stay at high latitude during the winter. So snowy owls are feeding on lemmings and voles, small mammals like that. And we know that they, th those go through population booms and busts. And if there's a population, uh, then they will stay around. And again, as long as they can have sufficient food, then they will scoff at the, at the cold weather. But when those vole populations or other small rodent populations go down, then they're forced to leave. And so they end up at places like Logan Air Airport where they feed on rats. So that's a, one of the better places to find snowy owls in the Northeast is, Lo is Logan mm -hmm. Airport. And a similar question from Eleanor, how do golden crowned kinglets find enough food to live through a main winter? Ah, with great difficulty, I'm sure. We realize that your golden crowned kinglets are half the size of a chickadee. And the smaller you are, the more difficult it is to maintain a constant body temperature because you have a really large surface area and to lose heat in a very small body to produce so and also know that golden crown kinglets are, are entirely uh, carnivorous. So they're not feeding on seeds, they're feeding on frozen insects. So it's just remarkable to me that they're able to do it. I don't, I don't know how they do it, but obviously they do. And of course their cousins, the ruby crown kinglets, they just say, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go down to North Carolina for the winter. Um, so we have, it's 7.58. If you have final questions, please get them in now. Um, and we still should end on time. And I see a couple more coming in. Um, we've had the impression that American robins I see in the winter in Western Maine are perhaps the ones from Newfoundland. Uh -huh. Is that so? The, well, the, yeah, the Newfoundland ones, they can, they can be all over the state, but, that, but they're really, really dark, really dark on the back. Great. Uh, from, from Glenn. How common is red cross bill breeding in southern Maine? They have been around the state, uh, they have been around this late fall, sorry, they've been around this late summer fall in the White Pines. Yeah, so there, there, are, some, there are some breeding records for this fall for red cross bill in, in Oxford County. Um, and another one of these uh, enigmatic species that they wander broadly looking for, for pine cone crops. And if they find a good crop, then they will just stop right there and they'll breed. So it's pretty amazing. I, one of the most amazing sites that, that I had in my birding career was being in uh, northern Vermont in late January when the temperature was, was minus 35 degrees and white winged crossbills were nesting. It was just amazing. There was just so, so much in the way of person uh, tamarack cones that they were able to, to nest in those conditions. So once again, Food's so important to birds. You give them enough food and they can do most anything. And I have to say, I, I was in um, uh, Shirley Mills, Maine, up near Greenville uh, this January and saw white cro uh, white wing crossbills doing the same thing. Full yeah. display, singing everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was nice, actually, to be pulled out of the winter. Um, okay, I think we'll, we'll end on this uh, yeah. question from an anonymous mystery attendee. Um, on the topic okay. of declining <laughs> populations, are there any birds that you know around here that are likely going to face local extinction? Well, yes. Yeah, so the, the, the birds that are most susceptible are going to be those that are relatively rare. And sometimes you, you, for birds that are rare, they, they often are at the edge of their range. And so for them to weak in and out, it's not, not unusual. So I, I can't think of any bird species. Maybe Bicknell's thrush, maybe, maybe that would be, because there aren't all that many, but uh, maybe that would be one that would be susceptible to extinction in Maine. Uh, and maybe, I mean, this sort of becomes ridiculous after a while, but you, you could also talk about American pipits. And they only nest on top of Katahdin, right? So on the tablelands, but, but, but they would be susceptible too. But they're doing great worldwide, I mean, uh, continent-wide. They're very common, particularly out, out in the mountains in the West. So uh, birds that are on the margin, those are the ones I think that are being more likely to go locally extinct. Great, well, thank you. We're right on time. I don't, uh, Bert and Nancy, if you wanna say perhaps some closing words and we'll turn it to you. Make sure you take your mute off.
There you go. Can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. Thanks again very much, Herb, for your talk. I'm sorry there was a little bit of electronic <laughs> interference, but hopefully people got the gist of it. And uh, it was excellent. Thank you very much for, oh, for joining well, thank you us so much. tonight. Yeah, it was my, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks all, of you, all of you for coming. It was fantastic. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Bye, all.